This video is sponsored by NordVPN. A woman returns home feeling drained from a long day of work, so she sits down at her kitchen table filled with anticipation. She reaches across the table to a jar. Its contents swish and turn as she pulls it towards her. She sticks a fork into the floating blue-gray mass at the bottom, piercing a chunk and lifting it out of the swirling slough to deposit the wet, rancid nugget on her tongue. A foul, putrid smell radiates through the room. She takes another slimy, covered cube of rotten meat into her mouth. The jar was on top of her fridge for the last half year, so she expected the taste, but she never thought it would feel so… good? Okay, but why are people eating raw meat they've left out in jars for months at a time? I… why? And with that out of the way, let's get into it. Raw, uncooked, putrefied meat has been lovingly dubbed high meat among the initiated. Trigger warning, here comes the meat. As the name suggests, it's being eaten because the internet heard it could get them high. Some consumers describe feelings of euphoria and hallucinations after slurping down diced chunks of decaying meat. They also claim that the bacterial growth is beneficial to their gut microbiomes. These… these people know that yogurt and tempeh exist, right? Right? Uh, probably, but there's more to this unfortunate fetid flesh fetish. Just so we can get an idea of what the dangers of eating raw or rotten meat are, these are just a few of the many meat-borne illnesses that have plagued humanity for thousands of years. Oh goody! This'll be fun. Oh it will be. All right, because I care about you two, let's throw on some wholesome TV so we can all heal together. <laughs> huh. With today's sponsor, NordVPN, I'll change our location settings so we can watch our comfort movie, School of Sock. When they have over 5,000 servers in over 60 countries, no data login, and double encryption, there's no downside. Your identity and data stay safe, and you have the best VPN of 2020 according to Best VPN Awards. Silly Brew, in, in this house we love NordVPN and our 24-7 customer support. Not to mention Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee and the fact that they can help you get past any government restrictions. NordVPN can keep me and up to six of my loved ones safe from prying eyes when, when we're out using public Wi-Fi. Nord is currently offering their Cyber Month deal. So go to NordVPN.com slash bro to get a two-year plan plus one additional month. They'll even throw in a bigger discount just for signing up. Go to NordVPN.com slash brew for more info on NordVPN. After eating an old can of corned beef, a young man feels a sudden loss of feeling in his face. His eyelids droop, his breath becomes more labored, and he can no longer form words. His stomach cramps, and he cannot stop vomiting. And slowly, he feels himself losing the ability to feel his hands or feet. Later, in the hospital, he loses all feeling, and his breathing groans to a complete stop. That's botulism! You can avoid it by fully cooking or boiling your food, properly refrigerating any foods that use garlic or herbs, NEVER EATING ANY FOOD THAT SMELLS OFF. Sorry, folks, just had to make that clear. A teenage girl, after a day spent enjoying homemade hamburgers with her family, wakes up in the middle of the night with a growing urgency in her bowels. She runs to the bathroom, but to no avail, her father is already there. There's blood in the toilet, he shouts in agony, so she runs upstairs to the other bathroom. But her mother is trapped inside, either vomiting or simply retching. Her brother beckons her over to the kitchen sink, which he is currently bent over in pain. I won't look, he says, as she weighs her options. That's E. coli! This bacteria dies at temperature upward of 70 degrees, so properly washing, prepping, cooking, and refrigerating your food is the best method of household prevention. Also, don't eat anything that smells like it's gone bad! An older gentleman wakes up one morning fatigued and nauseated. He staggers to the bathroom, flicking on the light which makes his eyes ache. 
His eyes staring back at him from the mirror are swollen, and the rest of his face is so tender he can barely touch it. He goes to the hospital, barely holding in his bowels on the way. An x-ray shows eggs in his cranial cavity. The doctor tells him that they're pressing up against his brain, causing inflammation. That's what happens if you eat trichinella worms from undercooked pork, which, hey, we talked about before, here. Cook all meat to an internal temperature of 60 degrees and freeze any pork for a minimum of three weeks to kill any worms. Also, remember that smoking, curing, and pickling do not kill parasites. Also, don't eat any meat that has bacterial growth. There is also Listeria, Salmonella, Staphylococcus, Campylobacter, Shigella, Streptococcus, Anthrax, and that's just some of the bad bacteria that can grow on tainted food. Not to mention the countless more parasites and fungal growths. Practicing proper food safety makes food safer. Who knew? The point is that yes, there are good bacteria, but there are just as many, if not more, bad bacteria that might give you stomach cramps, some that can just straight up paralyze you. Methods to make high meat vary significantly, but recipes, and I use the word recipes loosely, do have some similarities. One is that they're all wildly dangerous. Just to be very, very clear, high meat is incredibly unsafe to eat. A YouTuber who demonstrates making high meat starts with an undisclosed meat, cuts it into little pieces, and then puts it in glass jars. After that, he just shuts the jars and leaves them out. He doesn't even put it into the fridge. After an indeterminate period of time, he takes a jar full of the mixture to show us the process, gagging as he opens it because it smells so bad. Ha! Huh, who knew rotten meat would smell bad? Learn something new every day! Then he just eats a sludgy chunk of whatever meat he left in there. I, I just can't understand why anyone would want that! Visa recipes have next to no consideration for basic food safety. Not only is raw meat difficult to keep clean in the first place, the only mention of how one avoids illness in most of these methods is to buy from a trusted butcher, which does not guarantee safety. Lots of high meat proponents argue that fermentation is no different than what they are doing. That letting a bunch of meat cutlets decompose in a jar is the same as, say, making cheese or baking bread, which is not true. Curating the microbial life we desire in a product like cheese, pickles, or kimchi requires very specific conditions, ensuring that it not only tastes good, but is also safe to eat. One of these methods is fermentation, the process of cellular respiration without oxygen. It even happens inside our own bodies. Our cells use oxygen to help convert nutrients like carbs into energy. But when oxygen is unavailable, lactic acid is produced as a byproduct of that process. Oh yeah, my yoga teacher told me that lactic acid is what makes your muscles sore after you work out. We purposefully ferment food and what the end product is depends on the addition of specific bacterial cultures. There are three basic types of fermentation. Lactic acid fermentation, which uses bacteria like lactobacillus to convert sugars into lactic acid, resulting in foods like sauerkraut, kimchi, pickles, yogurt, and sourdough. Ethyl alcohol fermentation, which uses yeast like Saccharomyces cerevisiae to break down sugars into alcohol and carbon dioxide, resulting in alcoholic beverages. Acetic acid fermentation, which uses bacteria like Leuconobacter to convert sugars into acetic acid, resulting in vinegar instead of alcohol. It's the difference between apple cider and apple cider vinegar. Fermentation in food production requires specific conditions that are strictly monitored. Yogurt is made by first heating up milk to a temperature of 185 degrees Fahrenheit for 30 minutes to kill off any spoilage organisms. Bacteria that turns milk sour, then it's cooled to 108 degrees Fahrenheit, where the good bacteria we want can grow, whereupon adding lactobacillus will start the fermentation process. Yeah, I don't think making yogurt is just leaving milk somewhere. My point exactly. Okay, this time I got a real question. What's the difference between high meat and dry aged steak? They're both just leaving meat somewheres, right? A dry aged steak is kept in a dry aging room with tight controls on temperature and humidity to draw moisture out of the meat. 
The meat's natural enzymes break down the connective tissue, making it more tender, but it also creates an environment hostile to putrefying bacteria. If the temperature or the humidity is off by a fraction of a degree, it could throw off the entire process and you'd end up with a bunch of rotten meat. As someone who likes cooking, I can tell you that that should be the end of the line. Curing is somewhat similar to the dry aging process, except that moisture isn't drawn out of the meat by a dehumidifier, but by a boatload of dry salt or a salt brine. Bad bacterial growth is inhibited by salt, quickly making the meat a hostile environment to microorganisms that spoil meat. So wait, is, is high meat fermented? The short answer is no. The long answer is no! <clears throat> the longer answer is fermented meats are made using specific bacterial cultures after sterilizing the product beforehand with salt, heat, or chemicals. Fermentation, dry aging, and curing are all methods of controlled aging, whereas high meat is rampant decomposition. It's the difference between landing a plane and crashing. Many high meat advocates argue that indigenous cultures have been fermenting food for thousands of years, and they're absolutely right. Kasumarzu, a Sardinian sheep cheese passed through the guts of live maggots. Kivyak, Inuit-style fermented little auk birds stored in a seal skin over the winter. And century eggs, Chinese duck eggs pickled in a salt clay mix, are all examples of culturally significant aged foods. The problem is, people aren't taking the time to understand the history or the specific methods behind these dishes. Yes, kasu marzu is maggot cheese, but the people making kasu marzu are Sardinian sheep farmers whose families have been perfecting it since the fall of Rome. Curing, drying, and fermenting came from the determination and creativity of early humankind to preserve food and make it last longer. Because we kept dying of food poisoning before that! Carefully and respectfully practicing traditional preservation techniques that have been passed down from one's ancestors is not the same as putting meat in a jar, and invoking someone else's culture to argue about its safety is insensitive at best. And I'm, I'm pretty sure we've all seen what it is at its worst. After all is said and done, I'm begging you, please, do not eat rotten or putrid meat. The overwhelming scientific consensus is that eating rotten meat is legitimately and terrifyingly bad for you, ranging from basic food poisoning to being left paralyzed or dead. While our gut microbiome does reap benefits from foods high in beneficial bacteria, putrefying bacteria isn't good for us. While it's likely that eating rotten meat could give you a euphoric feeling, there's no guarantee. Even if one bash feels good, the next could give you brain worms. Maybe, maybe you could just stick to making kimchi at home instead. That one was pretty tough, huh boys? <laughs>